everything got turned upside down. The way we used to do things, we could no longer do. We, the kids could no longer come in the cafeteria line, per se, and get their meals. We had to be innovative. We were still able to feed those kids who were not in school uh, by means of serving them from the outside. They would walk up to an entrance at the school, and the cafeteria worker would give them uh, two days' worth of food. You could, they would get two breakfasts, two lunch, and two suppers. When we first started, the uh, National Guards was here. And we would make the bags up, and the National Guard would actually pass them out. And it was a lot more work because we had to give them breakfast, lunch, snack, and supper all at one time. And then, you know, different families had, it was a lot. It was a lot of work. But we appreciated that we still had a job, and we was feeding the community. It was continuous, continuous, more hands on deck, making sure it still looked good, making sure the bags are folded, making sure it don't look balled up like you just giving them anything. Still serve with quality at a high speed and a high, high quantity that we had to serve during this year and a half. Hey, hello. On behalf of the Baltimore Museum of Industry, uh, welcome to this evening's virtual event called A History of School Meals. My name is Joel Miller, and I'm an educator at the BMI, as well as a graduate student studying the history of education at the University of Maryland College Park. Now, just last week, the museum opened Food for Thought, which is a new exhibit that recognizes and celebrates food service workers in Baltimore City Public Schools. Now, the school district's food and nutrition services staff prepare and distribute more than 88,000 meals to students every day. So, of course, playing a really critically important role in feeding children in Baltimore. Now, you can find transcripts, audio, photos from interview with nine staff members on the BMI's website, which is thebmi, T-H-E-B-M-I dot O-R-G, or from the QR code that you can see on your screen. Now, of course, we'd also love for you to come check out the exhibit at the museum, which is going to be up through at least the end of this calendar year, or you could check out the companion display that's on display at the school district's headquarters. Now, supported by the International Coalition of Sites of Conscience, this project was made possible in part by the Institute of Museum and Library Services, the Baltimore City Public Schools Food and Nutrition Service Department, and others. Now, what I'm excited to do is to introduce the moderator for this evening's event, Dr. Nick Jurovich. Now, Nick's going to moderate a conversation among a wonderful panel of city school employees, scholars, and journalists. We're going to capture this rich and complicated history of school meals in the U.S. in general, but in Baltimore in particular, as well as the way those historical complexities continue to shape experiences with school meals today. I'm really looking forward to learning from this group. Um, just a little bit about Dr. Jurovich. So Nick is an assistant professor of history and labor studies at University of Massachusetts, Boston. His research interests they're varied. They include labor history, public history, urban history, history of education, as well as the history of social movements in the U.S. in the 20th century. And uh, this past fall, Nick was kind enough to lend his expertise to moderate a version of this conversation on a panel at the History of Education Society's annual meeting that was held here in Baltimore. So in addition to all these titles and accolades, Nick is just an all-around good guy. It's really nice to see you again, and I'm going to let you take it away. And you are muted, Nick. You'd think after several years of this, you'd get that right. But nope. Uh, thank you for your patience, everyone. Thank you, Joel, for that very kind introduction. It is such a privilege to be here with all of you, with this amazing panel. Uh, the, the exhibit is truly tremendous. Um, I can't wait to see it in person. But I also, I'm really grateful you all have put such a robust portion of it online, which is a real thrill. Uh, I see in the chat, I am representing the Baltimore Museum of Industry. Uh, it is a phenomenal museum. Uh, I've been there with my children, can't wait to go back. Um, and I want to stop talking now primarily because we have such a wonderful panel of people here uh, to learn from. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce them each in turn by asking them a first question and asking them to respond for about five minutes. And then we'll have a conversation among this panel 
Uh, and then from there, we'll move to a conversation uh, with all of you who've come and there'll be a process of putting those questions in the chat so that we can we can read them and respond to them. Uh, thank you all for being here from all around the country. It's a thrill to see so many people tuning in as well. Uh, so I was hoping we could start uh, with Ms. Gail Pendleton, who is a food and nutrition services manager in Baltimore City Public Schools and whose uh, voice is featured in this exhibit. Uh, and Ms. Pendleton, I was hoping you could say a little about how you came to this work, your own path through this work, and now that you are in an exhibit, how that feels and uh, and, and what you hope, uh, hope people are taking away from this. Oh, and you're muted too. <laughs> yes, you would think I would know by now also. Um, Hi, my name is Gail Pendleton, and I am a food nutrition service um, floater manager. Um, um, coming to this work, uh, I was a young lady who needed a job, and that's how I began. I, I just needed a job because I was um, married. I just gotten married, a new mom, and I needed something to do. I needed an income. That's how I came about this job. And um, that led me to when I went in and we they trained um, young women coming in. Um, the training was great. Like, like now, the training was great. And the manager saw potential in me um, to move forward. She said, okay, you're doing pretty good. So she said, she told her regional, like, um, this young lady really, really is doing a great job. And I think she should move on to the next um move, which was a food service worker team. So I um, began doing that and then manager one, manager two, and manager three, and now Florida. So all of that um, led me to where I am today. Um, the path um, the path with this experience was awesome. It was awesome. Um, you learn everything about the students, um, the staff and and mainly about yourself, who you are in this in this industry, um, how you start to view things and how you know the importance of what you're doing. Um, that's what came about from my beginning of this until now. You learn so much about yourself and the important work you do. Um, yeah, that's that's pretty good. What else? <laughs> That's great. Thank you so much. Uh, and thank you for, for sharing your stories in this exhibit. Um, thank you. I, uh, I'll ask now, uh, our next panelist I'll ask to introduce themselves and say a little about their work is uh, Dr. Jennifer Gaddis. Uh, professor Gaddis is an associate professor of um, a community study, oh, no, civil society and community studies, excuse me, at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and the author of The Labor of Lunch, Why We Need Real Food and Real Jobs in American Public Schools, uh, a book that many of us uh, have read thinking about this exhibit and beyond. Uh, and I was hoping, Dr. Gaddis, that you could say a little about how your work informs our understanding of the long history of this work, how it's evolved, um, why we need real food and real jobs in our public schools. So. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much, Nick. And hi, everyone. I'm Jen. And I just wanted to start by saying that um, I really entered the world of learning about school food a little over a decade ago. And I would say that I learned so much from a lot of the school food service workers um, who let me just spend time with them in school kitchens. And sometimes they would bring in pictures of what things looked like in the past, how there, for instance, had been like a really functional bakery about 20 years like prior to when I arrived on the scene. And it just made me really wonder you know, why um, really um, heat and serve meals had become the norm in American public schools instead of scratch cooking. Um, if we look um, from a more like um, comparative context across a lot of different countries and their national um, programs, um, we often see a lot more scratch cooking. So that just made me really wonder um, partly like why we got to where we do now, because I would hear many of the workers also comment on how um, they really saw this relationship between um, the heat and serve model of like food uh, preparation and um, part-time jobs. And I'll just put actually um, in the link um, a report that I have been working on with the Healthy School Meals for All Wisconsin Coalition. We have a labor wages and compensation working group, and we actually just did a statewide study. Um, this is just the executive summary um, that you can see here, but we actually can see sort of the, um, the outcomes of this. So here in Wisconsin, um, four out of five um, hourly workers are in part-time positions. 
And we actually found there's only one district in the entire state that pays what we would consider to be a good wage. The rest pay low wages or poverty wages to hourly workers. So there's a lot of momentum right now across the country to try to get universal free school meals for all kids, which I think is really, really wonderful. But we can't ignore the fact that a lot of these programs that we have today are really built around a very low wage model of, of work. And um, I think during the pandemic um, and um, into today, a lot of the labor shortages um, challenges with um, staff recruitment and retention and turnover um, were really just exacerbated. But I think that it got a lot more people talking about um, the quality of jobs in school nutrition and paying attention to the fact that um, as we're really working to really build um, the best quality programs that we can for students, um, the conversation about job quality really has to be part of that picture. So um, some of the work that I do um, is really participatory in nature, meaning that I work with labor unions or school districts that are really interested in addressing these problems. Um, but in the book that Nick mentioned, um, I actually look at the very long history of school meals in the United States, and a lot of people will talk about the National School Lunch Program um, and say that it started in 1946, um, and that's technically true. That's when the National School Lunch Act was passed. Um, but one of the things that I think is so important about school meals is that they're really this um, huge and really beautiful community endeavor. So in the book, um, I actually spend the whole first chapter talking about how um, nonprofit school lunch programs were something that people worked together to create. So it was not only the labor of a lot of people serving um, the students, but actually a lot of parents and interested community members who really just had this vision for providing collective care and nutrition to students through these nonprofit programs. So I think that we're at this point today where we have to not only invest in the people who are feeding kids um, in schools who are employed to do so, but we also really need the labor of our collective community to do this organizing work to really make it happen. So I think a lot of the scholarship that I do is really just um, sort of designed to get people to think about how we can't just um, sort of magically think that the quality of school meals is going to improve without also really trying to invest in job quality because it really matters for students, um, not only for people to be able to stay in the jobs for a long time and get to know them and form relationships, but also um, you know, for people to really have um, strong culinary skills and be able to do things like work with local product. Um, so farm to school programs are something that I think a lot of people are excited about, but you can't really do a whole lot with farm to school if you don't have workers who have the hours and the culinary skills and the equipment and infrastructure um, to really take those um, ingredients and transform them into healthy meals for kids. So I think my um, I guess final thing that I would say is that I think what I really try to contribute to the conversation about school nutrition and um, school meals in general is just this, hey, you really can't ignore workers. They really matter. And for a long time, uh, this has been a profession that hasn't been particularly well compensated. And it is a very highly gendered profession. Still over 90 percent of school nutrition workers are women. Um, and I think that um, really this is a profession that sits at the intersection of education, um, food systems and care work, and all three of those um, tend to be um, sectors of our economy that um, really do extremely vital work, but actually are pretty um, low paid comparatively. So I think that this is um, a really important conversation to have about the value of this work. And so I really appreciate the museum exhibit um, highlighting just all the different dimensions of um, the work that you all do in school nutrition and showing it in such a positive. And thank you so much for that. And I, it makes me think just how much the themes you're touching on come through in the voices in this exhibit. I really think, you know, this sense of care work, this sense of community, the centrality of this work to not just feeding students, but to their experiences, to what happens when they come in the door first thing in the morning, what they take home. Um, it's it's really powerful and really important. And as you say, this is such essential work and yet has often been uh, very poorly compensated uh, for a whole variety of reasons. And so uh, thank you. I want to turn to an, another Another scholar of uh, food, uh, school food uh, now, um, Dr. Marcus uh, Weaver Hightower, who is professor in foundations of education at Virginia Tech, uh, and who is the author most recently of Unpacking School Lunch, Understanding the Hidden Politics of School Food. Uh, and this is a book that was out just last year uh, and has a comparative angle as well. So, you know, in addition to just thinking about this history uh, and that these hidden politics, uh, we'd love to hear too some of the comparative um, thinking you've been doing on this question of school food. Thanks for being here. Thanks very much. I'm so delighted to be here. This is uh, 
obviously a, a topic that's near and dear to my heart and I uh, really just love that the Baltimore Museum of Industry is, has chosen to highlight this really important work uh, and these really important workers and, and the, the kinds of work they do. Uh, a lot of a lot of my interest, uh, you can probably tell from the title of the book, is about the politics of all of this, right? Uh, and I think uh, Jen really nicely alluded to some of the politics that go into, particularly the labor aspects. But you know, we I, I'm always very interested in about why we sort of fight so much about school food uh, and what the nutritional requirements are going to be and. Uh, even sadly today, some people like questioning whether we should even have school food services and, and things like that. Uh, so some of those kind of moral and ethical issues that that, that come up with it. Uh, but like you said, Nick, the uh, I think there's really also uh, a, a real value in looking across cultures and across nations uh, to see, you know, who's doing what uh, and how they're doing it. Uh, I think one of the things that we can be really proud of in the United States is that we have, in, in a lot of ways, a very progressive school food uh, system uh, in place, and it's it's one that uh, is increasingly, I think, going to be uh, a part of the conversation about how we have a safety net for all kids. Uh, and you know, Jen was very nice to point out that the that uh, Wisconsin's governor uh, has has put it in their budget, and several states have. Uh, come across in, in making universal school meals uh, a reality. And that is has been a long term struggle for a lot of people, uh, not the least of which uh, food service workers who are on the front lines of seeing kids who really need these kinds of services uh, that, that really need this nutritional kinds of things. Uh, we're seeing more and more evidence that school food uh, makes a huge impact on on kids uh, in terms of not only their health, but academic success, just showing up for school, all those kinds of things. Uh, and it's interesting to look around the world at, at the various systems uh, that are out there. Uh, everything from, I, I look, especially in, in the book that you mentioned is uh, there's, there's an entire chapter on England's food uh, services, uh, which in many, many ways has kind of always about 10 years ahead of what we're about to experience uh, for good or ill, uh, right? So when Margaret Thatcher comes along and is, is starting to dismantle England's school food service, right? Ronald Reagan starts uh, down that path as, as well and, and leaves a legacy of, of uh, not very good things for the food service in terms of, you know, uh, worker pay, nutritional, kinds of things, uh, the, the sort of heat and serve model that, that comes along, sort of that least common denominator, uh, just the bare bones kind of thing. Uh, you, can, you can see many of those things happen in England uh, at the same time. Uh, we uh, also see things like Jamie Oliver, right, who came here to the U.S. and had his big show and, uh, a few years back on trying to uh, look at school food in West Virginia and then in Los Angeles. Uh, well, a few years before that, he uh, had kind of made really major reforms in England uh, and got a lot of sort of public attention on this. And I, I think that we're now at that point where a lot of public attention is, is being uh, put on school food and uh, the workers. And it's, I really appreciate actually the, uh, the tape that was playing of the interview uh, about sort of that, that pandemic era. I think uh, we learned a lot from the pandemic about the, the real value of the school food service and the people who work really exceptionally hard to make sure that kids are getting fed. I mean, they are essential workers in the, in the uh, deepest sense of that term. Uh, so that's, that's another thing I think that we've learned about kind of cross nationally and cross culturally is that a lot of places had that same kind of experience that, you know, when the pandemic came and, and shut the world down in a lot of ways that, you know, a lot of people did not have the kind of safety net they needed. And, and folks like uh, school food workers were uh, critical front line for, for doing that. So that's, that's to me, the kind of uh, the, the joy and uh, sort of intellectual development of looking cross-culturally is that it, it bolsters what we're doing also shows uh, some gaps where we could also improve as, as well. 
Thank you so much. And I, I will say, I was telling this story earlier for the um, just our panelists, but we did our panel at HES in uh, November, the History of Education Society. We walked right out and there was Marcus's brand new book with its bright pink cover and thought, okay, there's a person we need to be talking to. Um, and so uh, thank you for being here again. I, I wanna turn now uh, to Nora Delacour, who is an education journalist, has written on education and organizing primarily for Jacobin Magazine, also a fellow member of the Mass Teachers Association, as I am. Uh, and uh, I will say when this exhibit first came to my attention, when, jo when Joel, Joel reached out, I, as Joel mentioned, have worked on the sort of organizing efforts and history of what's called paraprofessional or education support professional work. Um, and as someone who researches that history, so much of the history of education really focuses when it does focus on labor on teachers, classroom teachers, of course. But there's this whole world of work that's essential for education, of which food and nutrition services are a part. And Nora has been writing about that world uh, in a way that's really been inspiring and exciting for me. So when Joel brought this exhibit to my attention, I thought, no. Or will be interested in. It. I want to hear what she has to say. So, uh, you've been covering uh, school food work, um, as many other forms of organizing, certainly during the pandemic and beyond. What's happening right now? How are you thinking about this as someone who's following, you know, the organizing efforts, the kind of politics of this in in the moment as a journalist? Um, thank you so much, Nick. Um, yeah, I mean, I think. There's a lot of important stuff going on right now. Um, you know, kind of leading up to the pandemic for a number of years, we were seeing this, this resurgence of um, organizing and militancy among teachers, but also some non-teaching staff in K-12 schools. Um, and I think that there's, there's a growing sense that, you know, when K-12 workers take collective action, um, it's not just that they're demanding the higher wages that they need and deserve, but they're really mounting, um, a heroic defense of public schools against the existential threats that they face due to decades of state level disinvestment and privatization. Um, and so the pandemic just kind of like ramped up the stakes on all of this. Um, and in terms of cafeteria workers, I think it really highlighted, you know, like people have said, the, the essential importance of their work um, and their courage, you know, getting out there on the front lines in the earliest stages of COVID. Um, but then at the same time, the egregiously low pay, um, insufficient or unstable hours, inadequate healthcare coverage, um, and in many cases, really stressful working conditions that cafeteria workers often face, these things didn't improve with COVID and they, they just got harder. And then with inflation, things have been harder still. So even though cafeteria workers face a lot of obstacles to organizing and they are less unionized than teachers, we're seeing them fight back. Um, and so, you know, last year there were a couple of um, strikes that were authorized by K-12 cafeteria workers who then ended up winning really important concessions from their um, districts before they had to actually walk out. Um, this happened in Minneapolis public schools. Um, the, the cafeteria workers authorized a strike right alongside the teachers and the paraeducators in that district who walked out. Um, and these workers are in different unions, but um, they were just really speaking out constantly in support of one another um, and really framing their fight as, you know, we need to save Minneapolis public schools from the dysfunction that has been caused by underfunding and inadequate pay. Um, and so, so right now in um, Hastings, Minnesota, 35 cafeteria workers are out on strike there, also with SEIU. Um, they're in the second week of their strike now. Um, and it's over these same things, the you know, dire staffing shortages that are caused by the fact that they are starting people out at less than $15 an hour. Um, so the workers I'm in touch with there say that they're kind of at a standstill, but um, they are determined to hold the line. Um, and then something else that's going on that's a really big deal is that um, in Los Angeles Unified School District, which is the nation's second largest district, um, 30,000 K-12 workers, so cafeteria workers, but also um, custodians, bus drivers, paraeducators, um, gardeners, a whole variety of different folks have authorized a strike overwhelmingly, like 96% of them voted to strike um, over these same problems, right? Like so part-time hours, totally inadequate pay, um, and all of the issues that these things cause. Um, so for example, the, the cafeteria worker who I'm in touch with there says that after 26 years of service in LA schools, she's earning just $16.91 an hour, um, which is not enough anywhere, but certainly not enough to survive in Los Angeles. 
Um, so these workers really do not want to strike. It's a scary prospect for, excuse me, it's a scary prospect for them. And um, they really don't want to cause the disruption um, in the lives of their students, but they really see it as like a, a last resort measure that they may have to take to, again, rescue the district from um, dysfunction that has been caused by, you know, like these vacancies that go on and on unfilled and make everyone's job harder. Students aren't getting the services that they need because they're just not paying people enough to live. Um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, th thank you so much, Nora. And it's a reminder, you know, so in, in higher education, we've been learning that we need to organize pre-K through PhD. It's not enough to be in our sort of isolated little buckets. And I think the same is true across schools that we need to imagine, you know, it used to be called industrial unionism, but certainly wall-to-wall -wall organizing that, that understands all of this work is essential and, and fights for all of it to be you know, living wage work and, and respected and honored. Uh, and I, I really do see this exhibit as a part of that too, which I think is so exciting. Um, I wanted to turn now uh, to Elizabeth Marchetta, who's the executive director of Baltimore Public School, uh, sorry, of Food and Nutrition Services for Baltimore City Public Schools, <laughs> not the whole system. Uh, and uh, wanted to ask you to bring us back to Baltimore and maybe talk a little about what's happening right now, uh, what you all are doing, and also a little about how this exhibit might be sort of helping you think about what you do and, 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 and sort of what you're taking away from it in, in the work you do today. Um, thank you so much. Um, well, I would say right now in Baltimore, we're facing many of the issues that others have touched on, um, whether it is, do we have enough staff on any given day to operate our 160 plus cafeterias throughout the city? Um, concerns about wages are very, very real. Um, we have been trying for years to try to push um, to get higher paid positions, and we are facing both, you know, restrictions that come with working in um, a bureaucratic system such as education, and also the fact that we're in an industry that has allowed for workers, you know, who are certainly in tipped professions to be exempt from the minimum wage for how long? Um, so there are very, very deep roots to why we are not paying people in food services and agriculture adequate wages. Um, and with all the goodwill in the world, you can't increase that without additional dollars um, for these meals. So we have seen astronomical increases in our uh, food costs over the past few years. And uh, at the end of the day, you know, we have to feed the kids um, and we have to figure out a way to make it work. And so um, trying to balance all of those uh, priorities is very difficult. Um, and we're not even talking about the actual quality of the food that we have out there, um, which might be far from ideal from what a lot of people um, think or want or have historically seen, but know um, based on a lot of the research that is out there now that school meals do actually represent a pretty healthy option for students. Um, and there's a lot of reason that we should be pushing to protect these programs, um, to make them universal and um, you know, making sure that this is not something that families are losing on just because um, you know, we're stuck in a bureaucratic um, way of looking at feeding students. But we you know, really want people to consider that you know, during the pandemic, school districts were out there making sure that every student had access to a computer for virtual learning. Um, meals should be no different. If a kid does not show up um, with a lunch for that day, it really doesn't matter what income um, level they come from. They should be able to have lunch because it is an important part of learning. Um, and we do see that there are other countries that really seem to get this a lot more. Um, and, you know, we're fighting, I, I would say those same fights. There's also similar fights throughout the globe that people working in food services face. Um, so, you know, this exhibit was a real incredible opportunity for us to lift up um, some of the stories of our staff. I've only been with our district for a little over 10 years now, um, and that feels like nothing um, compared to staff like Ms. Pendleton, um, who have, are pushing 30 years. Um, and we have our driver, um, Mr. Harvey, who actually started with our department in 1969. Um, so he is over half of a century working for food services, um, and it is really been, I will say, one of the most exciting things of my job in the past few years to see this exhibit um, come to fruition, to see how the design team, um, the um, photographer and um, producer Aaron Hankin were really able to capture some of the stories of our staff who are, are out there amidst 
these really complex conditions, but really get the very simple thing that students need to eat every day. Um, and I will say, um, you know, despite the low wages, we do see that many people really do feel called to this profession um, because they really do care about what is happening in their communities. Um, when the pandemic initially shut down schools, I cannot tell you the number of emails I received from our staff who wanted to be out there because they were worried about, about where the students in their schools would be getting meals from. So um, it, it was just really exciting to be a small part of making this exhibit happen. Thank you so much. And I did want to mention, those of you who clicked over to the site will have seen this, that while the exhibit has just opened at the BMI and it's sort of fullest form, a version of it hung in Baltimore City Public Schools headquarters this fall. Uh, and that's also exciting to hear that this history is not just, you know, living in a museum where we expect to encounter, but that this was encountered by the people going to work in the central administration of Baltimore City Public Schools. Um, and uh, would love to see more workers honored in the places where their work is being managed. Uh, love that idea. Uh, I, I have just a couple of questions I wanted to pose to our whole group, and then I'm sure our, um, our audience will have, have many questions as well. Um, when we came in, uh, we heard some clips about the experience of serving food during the pandemic. It's obviously come up in some of our comments already. Because in a weird way, we're now reaching something that at least our national government is trying to define as an end. Uh, but we also know there are ways in which we don't want to go back to normal, uh, or at least to a normal that wasn't working before. Uh, I would love to hear, uh, particularly from Ms. Pendleton, about this experience, as I know you were in it, uh, but also from all of our panelists about how we um, how we think about the lessons learned, uh, the experiences of this uh, pandemic moment as we move forward. Uh, so Ms. Pendleton, I might ask you to go first, but I'd love to hear from everyone on this question. Oh, I'm sorry, you're muted. Oh, wow. So um, the experience was um, scary. Let me say that it, it was really, really scary at first. But um, once the fear went, you started seeing the, the different families come and seeing the importance of what you're, that you're serving them. And you, you start to feel like, no, this is what I'm here to do. And I'm obligated to do this because guess what? It's so important. Our nutritional program is so important to every child. And, and they were thanking us for being there. The families were thanking you for being there, making sure that they had this, the, the, their children had food to eat. And parents were so grateful that even some of them had to go to work. They were happy that, guess what, that breakfast, lunch, and snack, and supper, dinner was there, that they wasn't concerned about that part of the pandemic. They were there. They, um, that nutritional part was, piece was there. And I thank our director for, I mean, she, you know, many hands, and she she does a lot. And to making this sure this had happened. And like she said, so many of our, so many other employees for um, Baltimore City Food Nutrition Department just wanted to get out there and just try to help in every area that they could, even try to deliver food to homes where some of the students couldn't get out because their parents were afraid that they may catch COVID or something like this. This was the nutritional program, I say, is we are some of the people that first see the students in the morning. We are, we are some of the people, us and along with the custodians. And it's so vital. Do you think if they're hungry, they can't learn. And so our, our, our nutritional program exists. It needs to exist and it needs to be free to every student uh, um, across this world, you know. But it's so important because our students can't learn if they're hungry. They're, they're going to class on an empty stomach. And, and what we incorporate also in it is a learning experience as far as the nutritional. Some of the students, because we, they live in desert areas, the fruit and vegetable programs that we offer, they get to have all of those things afforded to them. Everything is there. And it's a beautiful selection and it's tasty. And guess what? It's for the entire life. They, they, we're training them, teaching them the importance of eating nutritional foods so for a healthy, a healthy lifestyle, actually. But also it's just, it's so important. And we, um, we are proud. We are, I must say, we are a proud group of people. And when Baltimore City Food Nutrition Service, we are proud. We are. And uh, I love it. <laughs> I love it. 
we, we are so grateful you were out there for those students. Um, thank you so much. Um, I know others of you have been organizing around this, thinking about this during the pandemic. I don't want to call on anyone, but I'd love to hear what you all think about this as we're, as we're thinking about it now. Well, I would just say that as, as a parent of some young kids who are going to school uh, and I had a, a second grader and a eighth grader when the pandemic started. And uh, I mean, it, it really was a lifeline for us too, in a s sort of social sense, right? I mean, there, I, th I think I was uh, so impressed by the ways in which, uh, you know, school food professionals were really kind of the, the front line, if you will, of, of saying that, you know, we're all in this together, like, we're going to get in a bus and start delivering it to people if we need to. Uh, we're going to be out there and, and risking our health in this really sort of unknown disease and, and things. And so just, you know, walking down to the local school and picking up a meal uh, was really just, you know, it was it was a great diversion really for for my kids for those first few weeks where everybody was sort of locked down as well and, 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 and showed them something, I think, really important about uh, the folks who were uh, out there doing that work. Um, I have two comments actually I'd like to share in relation to this. Um, so first is that um, I think that the pandemic opened up a lot of opportunities for doing more political education for people about how school meal programs work. And I think um, here locally, um, one thing that was really impactful was um, a, a lot of people in my community in Madison, Wisconsin, did a lot of conversation around um, really trying to reach out to people whose um, children don't qualify for free and reduced meals and explain to them why their participation in the program really matters. And I think that some of them started paying attention a little bit more to school meals um, since the meals were actually coming into their home if they were getting them. And so I think that opened up some conversations for us here about um, meal quality. And one thing that I'm really proud of um, from this past year was um, at the beginning of the school year, there were just like multiple media reports that kind of came out right after the other about how like bad school meals were at the beginning because there were some issues with um, just some supply chain challenges and some labor shortages. And instead of just being like, oh no, school meals are terrible and like leaving it at that, we were able to really have this conversation not only with our local media, but with a lot of different groups um, around Madison about well, let's let's think a little bit more about what's actually happening. And we put together a petition and got, um, I think within a couple of days, like over 700 signatures um, of people saying, we need to actually really make an investment in um, our school nutrition workforce. And um, we actually had the school board vote on this and it was a unanimous vote. And they actually increased base wages for all school nutrition workers um, by $5 an hour in one fell swoop. And that is why we now have one district in the state that actually pays um, what we would consider to be a good wage. So um, I think that that was something that probably wouldn't have happened um, as easily pre-pandemic because we were able to build on these conversations about, well, why does our school meal system look the way that it does? Like, why does it look in such a way that um, certain families are opting out of this program, even though it's offered to them in our schools? And then the other thing that I just wanted to mention, um, I'll put in the chat, um, I actually um, did an op-ed in the Washington Post around this question of, hey, schools are having a lot of issues with um, worker recruitment and retention. So the labor challenges in schools are very real, as are um, some of the supply chain challenges. Um, but if you look at some of the school districts that actually do more scratch cooking and more farm to school sourcing, a lot of them were actually having fewer issues because when you have more of a scratch cooking model, instead of having a lot of these um, positions that might be shorter hours and um, not be benefit eligible positions, you tend to have um, more full time positions that actually come with benefits. And you also have a lot more flexibility with how you actually are sourcing and preparing meals because you're working with you know, more basic ingredients. Um, so some of the supply chain bottlenecks about um, particular products um, maybe not being um, accessible for the K-12 market um, are a little bit less of an issue if you have the ability to cook from scratch. So I think one of the things that for me is a real lesson from the pandemic is that we actually need a very massive federal investment and in not only the infrastructure for scratch cooking and more local and um, regional food sourcing. Also, we really need to make an investment in our school nutrition workforce. So I've been really inspired by some of the things that have happened during the pandemic, like the state of California um, working to um, invest 
think it was $45 million in their Healthy School Meals Pathway Program, which is basically a worker training program. And there's a lot of work going on in California right now that's also um, sort of designed to say, well, we don't just need worker training um, in terms of really helping um, the school nutritional workforce um, be able to do more scratch cooking. We also have to make people um, more um, able to actually stay in these jobs. So um, I think there's some interesting work going on in California right now around not just how do we build the workforce that we really want to see in schools, but how do we make sure that we have enough resources to compensate them properly so that they'll stay in the jobs. So Chef Ann Foundation and some other organizations I think have been doing some fantastic leadership work in that area and that's been happening during the pandemic. So that's a lot, but um, I think those are some of the things that I've been excited about in relation to pandemic. Um, yeah, just a, a quick comment about um, kind of like how we look forward post pandemic. Um, you know, I think like so many people in this panel are talking about how we, we can't go back to the way things were. And I think, you know, um, like the healthy school meals for all coalition that uh, Jennifer mentioned, like, there's there's so much momentum behind um, in all different states, like pushing for, you know, making sure that we can actually have universally free school meals. And um, there's a lot of um, focus on like, you know, labor issues and, and, and all of the things that Jen was talking about. Um, and I, I think that my big lesson from the pandemic is like, we just, we need to focus on these things and we need to keep repeating this narrative because this effort, you know, like, I write a lot about the K-12 culture wars and, you know, there's this really, these really serious attacks on students and educators um, that are efforts to divide us, you know, and gin up controversy um, in order to end public schooling. And so I think, you know, things like the fact that kids deserve to be able to eat a healthy meal at school, like there, we can build broad coalitions around that, you know, like Republicans and Democrats agree about that. You know, um, and the fact that we need to respect and honor and value the workers who make that possible, like we just need to keep bringing the focus back to these basic things that um, that make schools function. I'll just add into that um, one thing that I was new with the pandemic was that we were um, giving out meals to adults. We'd never done this before. We're used to dealing with this uh, student customer. Um, and as soon as we set up our programs, we were doing meals outside. Um, we knew that adults would be curious and interested as to what was happening. Um, we also know that pre-K students uh, should not be just wandering out in the streets trying to find their closest school to find a meal. Um, and before USDA, was allowing um, certain exemptions for adults to pick up on behalf of students, we made a decision that we would be feeding adults for free. Um, we were very lucky because um, we didn't have any funding from USDA to do this. And we had a local foundation that stepped forward, the Fund for Educational Excellence, that helped to cover the cost of these adult meals. Um, because it makes no sense that we would be feeding the students um, and sending the parents back <laughs> without food. Um, and so we really, I think, experienced what it means to uh, provide to a community and the role that schools can act as in emergency settings as food distribu distribution hubs. I mean, we had all that food out there. We have so many schools in the city. We have more schools, cafeterias than we do um, of any food chain. And so really recognizing the power of schools, um, even though we usually, I will say, get less attention paid than the education piece, um, and teachers and things like that, most people don't think of their school cafeteria as the largest food chain in their town. Um, and very often, especially in large cities, it is. Um, so we really just found that, you know, there was this engagement with adults that was happening. Um, and, you know, it, it, adults were really becoming more informed of what was being offered because they were actually seeing the meals that students were getting. They weren't just hearing from students at the end of the day if they liked lunch or not. And, you know, it's too easy to say that you don't like the meal that you're being offered, um, but it was a really great educational opportunity um, for adults. And the other thing, you know, that we realized that we talk about creating a positive uh, mealtime climate, um, and we forget how many kids come into a cafeteria. Um, and as we're coming out of this pandemic with all of the mental health challenges that we are all facing, 
you know, thinking about what it means to be able to get a free meal at school and what could that sort of benefit look like if we actually offered it to the adults in the building, not just the children. Um, it doesn't inherently really make any sense why we wouldn't be feeding adults for free either, other than these are the restrictions of this program. Um, but we, you know, really for us, I think it was an interesting thing to recognize and consider that this is something that, you know, could really be positive to engage adults in uh, more often. So, um, you know, I, I, I just, to me, that is something that has kind of come out of it as, you know, for the next uh, 100 year pandemic, I hope, you know, the federal government is really quick to think of this as a way to effectively get food out there. And it makes no sense to be um, hitching it to the fact that it is a young child or a school aged child. Um, and then the last thing that I'll just add is, Baltimore City has served universal free meals to students since 2015, when we started the community eligibility provision. Um, and so we have, for several years, have been feeding all students for free. That was not something that was new to us. But what was doubly um, emphasized for us during this time was how lucky we were to participate in that program, um, because it was just heartbreaking to watch families and to witness school districts that had to still ask for income applications that had to turn families away. Um, people that were concerned or in fear did not want to give out income information. Um, we, we didn't have to face those hurdles. We really just had to ask people how many kids they had enrolled in our school district and that was all the information we needed. Um, so, you know, there, there's so much to be learned from that, but I think the simple thing is that there's so much bureaucracy that we can do without, um, and there are simple things that we know, which is feeding kids is important, and we shouldn't be relying on children to return a household income application form in order to access something that is as essential to learning every day. I attempted to use all of my reaction buttons. Uh, to everything you all have said, and I truly thank you all. I think this, even just answering this one question, you've shown how thinking about this particular work can take us from these really important interpersonal interactions. You know, like you were saying, how does the student who is having a rough day uh, change their mood when they have a free meal and a friendly face that they know and they can rely on being there, not just day after day, but year after year? This question of craft that, that, that Jen raised and that comes through so powerfully in the exhibit. You know, people who had for years cooked from scratch. But who even when they're you know working with pretty limited ingredients are presenting them in such a way as Ms. Pendleton said that students will actually be excited about the food and eat food that's maybe new to them that's fresh um, and the the last thing that, that some of you all were saying just made me think you know right when we start to think hey these are the largest you know food food providers uh, largest change in our cities we're not just asking how do we feed students we're asking what it would look like if we fed people who were hungry and people who were healthy and what that would look like at a, at a societal level and so um, this has been a really powerful conversation. I'm just so grateful to all of you. I also want to leave some time for our audience. Uh, we've already had some great interaction in the chat, but uh, let's go ahead and use the Q&A function and please ask us some questions. Um, share your thoughts. We'd love to respond in the, in the next 15 minutes. Um, and if anyone has any thoughts before we get a question coming in, feel free to chime in as well. And if you want to react to one another, there's a lot of great stuff that's been, been said here. Um, yeah, I just, I love what you said, Liz, um, about, you know, like, what if we feed adults too? And I had that experience at the school I worked at last year. Um, they, they were they were letting teachers and counselors and all school staff eat the meals because of the federal flexibility. Um, and it just, it, it cultivated such a wonderful feeling of community and solidarity to be able to talk about the chicken nachos with my students, but also, you know, the other teachers and the principal, like, it just felt like we were all truly in it together. And um, I think that was really awesome. I think if um, those barriers are taken off of everyone in these city schools and in, in every school, and the teachers are eating along with everyone else, students would be more um, willing to, who, who feel as though I don't want that, more willing to go into the cafeterias and eat because guess what? Everyone's around them that eating the same thing, the same opportunity. The barriers are off. We're free to learn. We're free to eat. Kara, thank you for your comment here in the chat.
as a follow-up, I will, because we've kind of touched on this already, but for those of you who are especially thinking about this in the here and now, if there are action items you have for all of us, whether that's uh, you know federal or state level things that are happening, or for that matter, places to further educate ourselves, by all means, feel free to share them in the chat or uh, mention them here. I think this is, you know, we are thinking forward as well as about the history here. And I know you've, you've mentioned some of these already. Since we have the platform that is not just within our Baltimore City, I would just urge everyone to check out the universal meal legislation that might be happening in their state. Um, this is certainly something we hope happens on a federal level, but until it comes, we are all part of a smaller organization called the state. And anything we can do to support these programs um, with state dollars and protections, because they are essential, and I will say it does feel like the pandemic allowed us to take off our, you know, the bureaucratic hats and, and just picture what this could look like without restrictions. Um, last year, you know, is the first year a lot of people were taking income applications again. And really that should not, we shouldn't be doing that. Um, there's just no way that this makes sense. And um, so I would just strongly support everyone to get involved at the local level. Um, to try to support universal meals in their state. They're not lucky enough to have it yet. Yeah, and, and just building on that uh, and, and something Jen said earlier as well, that the, this, the, we're at a sort of political opportunity moment, uh, you know, that uh, politicians who uh, insist that, you know, that we continue this ridiculous sort of three price kind of system uh, that we have to have those uh, forms turned in and things should be named and shamed at the federal level, right? I mean, like, uh, this is this is not a politically popular position to take. Uh, and so much of the uh, sort of political back channels were done in private, uh, nobody giving quotes to uh, journalists, uh, those kinds of things about why they didn't want to have universal free meals at the federal level. And it's, you know, there are ideological arguments that you can make about it, but all of the evidence, I think, uh, not only from like nutritional studies, but academic studies, uh, just the, the reduction in paperwork that it would take, all of the kinds of arguments are working against that kind of uh, political position. So I think uh, continued uh, pressure at the federal level is, is really important as well. Uh, I'm incredibly heartened to see all these states kind of lining up to do it. Uh, but for instance, Virginia just had discussion of this uh, at uh, the, the state level in the House committee and they rejected it, right? Uh, and and this were Republicans. Uh, these are the ones that uh, the, uh, the politicians that generally speaking are against universal uh, free meals. And, and so uh, working at only the state level is, is it causes considerable concern and you know that that we have opportunities in the next election cycle to to restart a conversation at the federal level especially when we have uh you know states that are doing the experimentation for us and uh the the community eligibility provision uh districts that are showing us that these things work uh, in in really powerful ways Thanks so much. I also I do want to be mindful. I know, uh, Jen, that you might have had to have to leave in a minute or two. So if you do, thank. I want to make sure we all thank uh, Dr. Jennifer Gaddis for being with us and for sharing all of this. Um, so thank you. Uh, and I see a comment here or a question um, from Jane Berger, who, if this is Jane Berger, the historian, wrote a phenomenal book about Baltimore called *The New Working Class*, uh, and is asking us about. Um, the uh, question of privatization, which of course is one that's been happening all over the country, not not just perhaps in Baltimore. I actually don't know that story in Baltimore, so I'm, perhaps Ms. Pendleton or, um, or Liz, you know. And then also this question of uh, if AFSCME, uh, and is that if that's the union that represents uh, food food service workers, if they've been involved? Yeah, um, actually, our in Baltimore City, all of our food service workers are represented by AFSCME Local 44. Our cafeteria managers um, are represented by the City Union of Baltimore, CUB. Um, and as to if there has been any privatization, um, there has been in the, in the history of the school meal program in Baltimore City, 
Um, in the 90s, some of the high schools um, were, I believe it was Aramark, um, were privatized, um, but they actually came back to the school district. Um, I don't think it was the magic solution that whoever made that decision thought it was going to be. Um, certainly as the person who uh, runs our department now, I would never ever want it to be privatized. Um, we have a tremendous benefit by having workers who are employees of this city, who um, benefit from a lot of the same benefits that our teachers um, and leadership do. Um, so we're really happy that we have a unionized workforce outside of our uh, top four managers and our director. Um, the other thing, um, no, that was, I think that was it. It was AFSCME and the privatization, so. Thanks so much. And we have a question that came in. I realize I think we've got the chat and the Q&A, two models, uh, but we can answer all these questions. So this is a question from Beth Maloney about information or resources to share regarding the role that the Black Panthers played historically in advocating for school meals, particularly breakfast. Um, I have some thoughts as a historian, but happily open this up to others who've, who've researched this as well. Uh, this certainly resonates at this moment that says interested in this intersection between politics, community care and service. I will say quickly, there, there's great work on the Panthers um, uh, and, and a variety of, of scholars who've done this, um, looking at the, the free breakfast program and the way that that took shape and influenced the entire nation and actually inspired in many cities uh, action to try to sort of address this issue of free breakfast, if only to keep the Panthers from having further influence. Uh, so there's some kind of a rear guard reactionary action in some cases, as well as some more uh, thoughtful embraces of this. Uh, in New York City, uh, there was an organization called the United Bronx Parents uh, who took a model from the, um, from the Panthers and began not just serving breakfast, but summer meals. Uh, and the city now has uh, the largest summer meal program in the country. It's the largest district in the country, really thanks to the efforts of a group of largely Puerto Rican mothers uh, who built a program and eventually got the USDA grant for the entire city to provide food. Um, and this is, this is covered in a book um, by Alana Povitz called Stirrings, uh, which is a really great one. I'll try to drop a link in. Maybe someone said a Panthers yeah, book. I know. agree with Nick that that's a really great book. And I actually cite that and um, some work on the Black Panthers in the second chapter of my book. And I would agree that... Um, I think what the Panthers were doing was um, both an indictment of the failure of the federal government to provide school meals for, for students. I think there was a lot of structural racism that was um, really um, just baked into the structure of the program um, from the very beginning, such that a lot of historians have done work on this will show that um, in the first like 20 or so years um, after the National School Lunch Program was created in 1946 at the federal level, it was predominantly white middle class students who were actually benefiting from the program and a lot of students um, from um, more rural and even urban areas um, that were more um, situated in communities of color were really um, very much like um not being served by the program so i think that the panthers like they did um, an amazing thing in, in terms of really thinking about what um kinds of of just systems needed to be created to care for those in their community and um, i think that there um, is a lot of work that shows that just the success um, of some of their programs in particular the breakfast program it was incredibly popular and so it was actually something that i think um, certain politicians actually felt um, threatened by and so i think that there um, is a fair amount of discussion about how uh, the USDA's breakfast program um, was something that was in discussion, but maybe was um, in some ways um, rolled out a little bit more quickly um, in order to subvert some of the political power um, that um, the Panthers were starting to build through their school breakfast programs. But I think that um, it really offers an important lesson for us today in terms of what it looks like for students to feel like they're being served um, by people who really care about them and a space that really dignifies their presence as humans. So one of the things that I think I personally take away from that history is that um, it's really important um, for students to feel respected um, by institutions, specifically schools that serve them. And so um, there are actually a number of youth organizations now that are really working to get more culturally relevant meals in their schools and, um, you know, things like recognizing that some of their classmates might have dietary restrictions that schools aren't actually meeting now, or even recognizing these intersections between what they see as the quality of their meal 
field and what sort of job conditions um, school nutrition workers uh, might be facing. So in Milwaukee, um, as an example, um, a, an organization called Youth Empowered in the Struggle, um, they're doing some really great work on all of these issues. And I see real roots in terms of you know, what the Panthers were trying to do, which was to say, well, look, you know, the federal government isn't serving us through these programs, so we're going to actually create the kinds of programs that work in our communities and make, you know, our students feel loved and respected because that's a really important, like, foundational you know, thing for young people. So I think that there's a lot of lessons that we can take um, from, you know, what, uh, you know, they did and really think about today um, in terms of what students really deserve and what the spirit of our program should look like. I realize we are coming up on eight o'clock. Uh, I'm looking to see if there are any other questions that have come in. Um, try to drop a link to Jane Berger's book in as well, uh, which apparently, uh, as she mentioned, includes some discussion as well of the, of the Ask Me frontline workers uh, in, in cafeteria. So this is really wonderful. Um, any final thoughts from our panelists as we're wrapping up? Nora, it looks like you're about to say something. Did I cut you off? No, I wasn't going to say anything, but um, I just found it to be such an incredibly beautiful and moving exhibit. And I just, I'm so grateful that it happened, that it's ongoing. I just want to say a thank you to the Museum of Industry for actually making this happen. Um, thank you to Ms. Pendleton for responding to an email asking for another unpaid opportunity opportunity to do something great because really the stories that I've heard from our workers continue to inspire me as I work longer at the school district and it's just truly amazing um, the commitment that the frontline workers really do have to our, our city and I, I'm sure this applies to other cities but as she mentioned we're very proud in Baltimore so <laughs> thank you. Well Thank you all so much for joining us, everyone on this webinar, as well as our panelists. It's been such a privilege to hear from and learn from all of you. Um, thank you again, in particular, uh, to Ms. Pendleton here as representative of our food service workers who are honored in this exhibit, and rightly so. Uh, and thank you to the Baltimore Museum of Industry, Ani and Joel, for putting this together, everyone who's been involved in the exhibit. Uh, it really is such a thrill to see this work spotlighted in the museum, in the Central Administration Building, and online in this way. Uh, so thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>